Welcome back from spring break. Uh, today we're going to be going through, uh, finish up the podial we started before we left, which was on equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle. And we talked a little bit about this, uh, this concept of, of chemicals going backward and forward in a, in a reversible reaction. You're actually going to be doing a real reaction this Thursday in lab. So, uh, we won't be, in other words, we won't be using the M&Ms. <laughs> we'll be using real molecules that actually are in chemical equilibrium. So this is just to make sure we understand the concept before we start the lab. I'm going to begin the podial on page two. I'm actually going to go through the entire thing with the answers, and then we'll see. You, you should be using this as a way to check your answers. So if you haven't already with your groups, go through model one, answer the questions on model one, which go all the way up to number six, and then come back to the video to see if your answers are correct. Okay, you should be done with model one right now, questions. So I'm just gonna go through them here. And we're looking at the model where you have a, some kind of manufacturing plant where you always have 100 people inside at a given time, and every hour there are 20 of those people will be on break and 20 of them will be returning. Okay. And it says, how many employees move into and out of the factory building during each hour? Well, they say 20 in and 20 out. That's all we needed for number one. Number two, are the employees who moved in and out of the building each hour the same people? Well, no. If you were going on break for 20 minutes and leaving, and then you come back in and immediately go on break again, I don't think they would pay you for that work. So no, they are not the same people. No. Can't take more than one break. Plus, they're doing it at the same time. It would be impossible for the people to be simultaneously moving in and out of the building. You can't do both. Number three. Does the number of employees in the building change from hour to hour? Well, if we think about this, and this is especially true in the case of the M&M's thing we did last week, or three weeks ago at this point. 20 came in, 20 went out. Okay, that, that, that's a net change of zero. So no... The in and out are equal, I would say. Number four says, over the course of a day, the employees in the Acme Manufacturing Plant are said to be in dynamic equilibrium. Based on your understanding of how the staff move in and out of the plant, explain what is meant by the term dynamic equilibrium. Hmm. Well, let's think about this. We have the same 100 employees working at any given time. We just have 20 going on break and 20 coming back. So this, there's the same total number of people working. Just some of them happen to be going in and some of them happen to be going out. Uh, they are changing places. They're certainly swapping with each other. Okay. So we'll say they're swapping... They're in motion, I guess you might say, is another way of calling this dynamic. But they're in equilibrium in the sense that there's always only 100 people working. That's it. There's th That number never changes. So even with all the swapping, even with all the motion, we can still maintain a stable number of workers. So we'll say the movement... of the workers is balanced so we always have the same number of people working All right, sounds good to me. And if, in general, dynamic 
is indicative of motion or moving. Static is not moving. So a dynamic equilibrium is one in which there is motion, in this case motion of people into and out of the building, maintaining a, a, a balance. Static would be you just have 100 people working, nobody moves in or out. Some vocab for you there. Number five. Five has a bunch of choices, so we'll do 5A first. A new, faster, and simpler check-in, check-out process has been proposed for the workers at the plant. Some workers have said this new process acts as a catalyst. And they say in parentheses, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction without changing the outcome of the reaction without being used up in the process. Okay, good to know. Would this new check-in, check-out process change the number of people in the building at any given time? Why or why not? I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is that 20 people check in, check out, they go to lunch for an hour, and then they come back in while 20 more people go to lunch, right? So they're just 20 in, 20 out. How fast it takes them to physically walk from the lunch area to the building and check in is not going to affect the fact that 20 are moving each time. So I would say no. The relative numbers of employees moving does not change. The number of people moving doesn't change, they just get there faster. Alright, that's 5A. 5B what would be the effect of the new check-in, check-out process on the workers at the factory? They get to work faster. Or to break faster. Either way. They change places faster, you could say that. And then part C, support or refute the idea that the new check-in, check-out process is like a catalyst. Okay, so what it says, it says a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction without changing the outcome of the reaction and without being used up. Okay, so these workers were sped up, okay, into and out, but it didn't change the outcome. They were still in equilibrium. They still got to equilibrium, they just got there faster. And the catalyst apparently doesn't change the chemical reaction, it just gets you to equilibrium faster. So, the workers got to the same state of equilibrium as before. My letters are really sloppy. Good thing this isn't an English class. Same state of equilibrium as before, but they got there faster. Good times. And let's do number six. When the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen reaches equilibrium, does the number of molecules in the reaction vessel change? Oh. Okay. Well, so now we have to make a bunch of connections. Well, did the number of workers change when they got to equilibrium? No. And you saw this with the with the M&Ms. Once you got to equilibrium, the number on each side didn't change. So I'm going to say no. We still have the same number. Okay, let's look at B. Is the reaction still proceeding in the forward direction? Well, yeah. Yes, I guess if I'm going to be 
precise there. Yes, the reaction still goes in the forward direction. We still have reactants changing into products. Because the, the, the movement of the workers into and out of the building simulated the, the reaction of, of chemicals forward or the reaction of chemicals backward. Yes, the reactants change into products. Okay, is the reaction still proceeding backwards? Yes, the products change to reactants. I'll let you fill that in. Okay, D, are the concentrations of the products and reactants changing? Concentrations. Actually, we still have the same amount of workers on break and the same amount of workers inside the building every hour, so no, I would say they are not changing the concentrations. Are the rates of the forward and reverse reactions the same? Yes, 20 in, 20 out. And of course, with chemical reactions, the same thing. Does the heat content of the system becomes const become constant? Now, let's think about this. This, this might be trickier than you, you imagine. Some reactions are like this. Reactants in equilibrium with products plus heat, meaning that every time the reaction goes forward, heat is created. And some reactions are the opposite. They are reactants plus heat in equilibrium with products, in which case heat is a reactant instead. But I'm going to isolate the top case here. Every time this reaction goes forward, we gain heat because heat is a product. But every time it goes backward, we lose heat because heat is going, you know, is, is uh, now a reactant in the reverse direction. So for the top case, every time we go forward, we gain heat. Every time we go backward, we lose heat. But think about what we know from part E. The rate of the forward and the backward reaction are exactly equal. So we are gaining heat in this direction just as fast as we are losing heat in this direction. So I would think the heat content is constant. And the same should be true of the bottom one. When we go forward in this bottom one, we're losing heat because heat was on the left. When we go backward, we're gaining heat. But again, if at equilibrium, the forward and backward rates are the same. So the heat, I would say heat, yes, the heat content of the system is constant at equilibrium. Okay. All right, that's model one. You are now going to go on to model two and answer all the questions for model two. I want you to go up to number nine. So this is going to be at the end of page five where it says, got it, go all the way to the got it question and then come back to the video. Okay, so by now you should have filled out the table, which I will replicate here. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, and so I'm just going to do some quick arrows. So they say H2 increases, direction it shifts is to the right. And to make sure we understand what we're talking about, this is 2H2 plus O2. which is an equilibrium with 2H2O plus heat. All right, so we have H2 up, H2 down. We have O2 increasing, we have O2 decreasing. We have H2O increasing, we have H2O decreasing, we have heat, which I'm going to write as delta H increasing, and we have heat decreasing, and we have pressure increasing and pressure decreasing. Okay, well according to Le Chatelier's principle, and they showed it up here. H2 was on the left side of the equation. If I added more H2, we got a shift to the right. 
That's because the more products or the more reactants you put on the left hand side, the more they push toward the product side. So in general, and I'm going to do this on the side here so we can kind of figure this out or come up with a pattern. We have reactant in equilibrium with product. Anytime you add something over here on the left, it pushes harder to the right. It's giving you more fuel. If I put in more, more reactants, they react faster and they change into products faster. That's all it is. If I have a bunch of products and I put in a whole bunch of products here, I'm increasing the products, they're going to react faster. They're going to push backwards and make more reactants. Okay? That's all this is. So, go back over here. Now, the second part says I take away H2. I lose H2. Well, H2 is on the left. So if I take away something on the left, it the left side loses, which means the right side will win, the right side will push harder, and the right side is pushing this direction. The right side pushes towards the left. So if I take away H2, I wind up uh, shifting the equilibrium towards the left. All right, the next one says increase O2. Well, if I increase O2, he's a, he's a reactant. I should be pushing harder towards the right. If I decrease O2, I should push harder towards the left. If I increase H2O, H2O, look where he is. Let me underline him here. He is over here on the right. If I increase him, he's going to push harder. He's going to push towards the left. And if I take him away, he's losing. The reactants will push harder towards the right. Then it says add heat. Where is heat? It's right up here. Look at that. There's heat. If I add more heat, he's on the right-hand side. He's going to push this direction. But if I take him away, he's on the right-hand side. If I take away the right, the left side wins and pushes that direction. Pressure. Ooh, got to be careful here. It's important to note that they said all of these guys are gases, which I didn't really write in there, but I'll try right now. That's a gas. That's a gas. That's a gas. So right now I've got to look and see which side already has more pressure. Mm. Well, I'll do this in blue. I see two H2Os, sorry, two hydrogens, and I only see, that's a one, right? If I don't put a number in front, it's only one. So I have two hydrogens and one oxygen on the left, so I have three gas gases on the left. I only have two water vapors on the right. So right now there is more pressure on the left than on the right. So if I increase that pressure, if I put more pressure in, there's a bigger pressure on the left that's going to, I'm increasing the left side more or less, so I'm gonna, that's going to push to the right. If I take away pressure, it'll push back to the left. So when you do pressure, you got to count them up. How, which side has more gas particles? That's the side with more pressure. And if you increase, it'll push from that side. Okay, so that should be your, your chart there, and now we'll go on to answer the questions. Question one. Oh, that is question one. Never mind. Question two. In general terms, describe the direction of equilibrium shift when the concentration of a reactant is increased. So, remember my, my thing here. When I make more reactants, they push towards the products, which is on the right-hand side. So, number two should be an increase to the right. Number three. If equilibrium shifts to the right, which is sped up, the forward or the reverse reaction. Well, this is it, to the right. We always consider right to be the forward reaction. Kind of a vocab question. Four, what happens to the concentrations of H2 and O2 if we shift to the right? Well, let's look at them. Let me, I'm going to rewrite my H2 and O2. H2 plus O2 in equilibrium with H2O and heat. What ha so 4 says, what happens to the H2 and O2 concentrations if I shift right? I'm going this way. When I go that way, I'm going away from H2 and O2 and going towards H2O. I'm losing H2 and O2. The forward reaction uses H2 and O2 and turns them into H2O. Let me balance this real quick. So the forward reaction, I should lose concentration of H2 and O2. Not really losing them, you're using them as fuel. Okay? Let's 
go 5. What happens to the concentration of H2O when it shifts right? Well, H2O is on the right. There he is. If I shift to the right, I'm increasing everything on the right and I'm decreasing everything on the left. So I should get more H2O if I shift to the right. All right, number six. If the equilibrium shifts to the left, which has sped up, the forward or the reverse? Well, the left arrow is considered a reverse direction in these reactions. What happens to H2 and O2 if I shift left? Well, if I'm shifting left and H2 and O2, let's look at them, there they are, they're on the left. So if I shift left, I'm going in their direction. I'm making more of them. More H2 and more O2 if I go left. What happens to H2O when I shift left? Well, H2O, remember, was up here on the right. So if I'm shifting left, I'm shifting away from the H2O. So if I'm shifting away from H2O, I'm using him up. Less, <laughs> did that in blue, okay, why not? Less H2O. And number nine, in what is true of the rates forward and the reverse reactions when a new equilibrium is established? So we only shift far enough until we're back to equilibrium. Once we're at equilibrium, the rates are equal. That's our definition of equilibrium. So the got it says, write a general description based on the information in table one that describes what happens to an equilibrium system when conditions change. All right. When equilibrium conditions. God, that was horrible writing. When equilibrium conditions change right because I came in here I, I would like I would add some H2 or lose some O2 whatever those changes were on this side here I saw a shift I saw the one of the reaction rates speed up either it went forward faster or it went backward faster but notice that when I changed H2 I made more H2 I put more stuff on the left side it shifted to the right side. When I took away pressure, I took away stuff that was on the left side, there was more pressure on the left side, it shifted towards the left to fill it back in. Okay, so when I change my equilibrium conditions, the reaction shifts. In other words, one of the rates will speed up. The reaction rates shift and they're trying to fix that change if I put more stuff on the left the reaction shifts to the right to make more stuff on the right to balance back out so the reaction rates shift whoops let me undo that there the reaction rates shift in the opposite direction opposite direction and they do it because they're trying to maintain balance I need a better stylus so when equilibrium conditions change the reaction rates will shift to the opposite direction to try and maintain the balance in other words if you make more stuff on the left uh, or add more stuff on the left of the reaction, it shifts to the right. If you take away more stuff on the left, it shifts to the left. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we're down to the got it section. Now you're going to go and finish the rest of the POJOL. And there's just four more questions. Plus a table. So come on back as soon as you've finished the rest of the POJOL.
Okay, should be all done. We're just I'm just creating the table here. I'm not going to put the lines in. So they give you this equation. They give you N2 plus O2 plus delta H in equilibrium with NO, like that. And then they give you four stresses, four different ways to upset the equilibrium. So right now, this reaction looks like it's in equilibrium up here, and then we're going to add some more N2. Right, just take a syringe and pump some nitrogen into this container. More nitrogen, okay? If we look, nitrogen is over here on the left. So if I add more of it, it has to push to the opposite direction. It's going to try and increase the forward rate in order to make more NOs. And so it asks, what happens to the NO concentration? Well, if I push forward, I should get an increase in the NO concentration. Because NO is on the right. O2, I remove O2, okay? O2 is on the left. I'm taking away something that's on the left. If I take away what's on the left to fix that, we have to push left to make more stuff there. So this reaction will shift left. And it asks, what happens to my N2 when I shift left? Well, N2 is on the left. So if I take away O2, I expect more N2 to be made to compensate because the reaction is going to shift in that direction. Then it says I take away NO2, sorry, NO. I'm taking away NO. Well, if I take away NO, it's on the right. This reaction has to fix that, so it's going to shift to the right. Okay. Then it asks, what happens to N2 if I shift to the right? N2 is on the left. If I shift to the right, I'm losing N2. I'm using it up. So I'm going to lose some N2 if I shift right. Lastly, I add heat. Heat is on the left. I'm adding something on the left, so it's going to push to the right. And it asks, if this pushes to the right, what happens to my NO? Well, NO is on the right. I would expect to get more NO. So that should be your table right there. Like that. Okay. And then there's questions. So, these... Oh, before we get to the end questions, let me, let me do this. They talk about the ammonia reaction, and they say this. The production of ammonia from its gaseous elements with the release of heat is known as the Haber process. So I'm going to write out the ammonia reaction for the last four questions. Ammonia reaction looks like this. Ammonia is NH3, the production of NH3. So I'm producing it, which means the arrow goes this way, and I'm producing NH3 three from its elements. Well, it looks like its elements are nitrogen and hydrogen. So N2 plus H2 are its elements. If I balance that, I get, what do I get? Two of those and three of those, I think. Okay. And it says, with the release of heat, if I'm releasing heat, that's a product. So delta H goes on the right side of this reaction. So we need to start with that first, otherwise we're not going to be able to answer any of the questions. Let me fix that too here. Okay. All right. Number one, write the complete balanced chemical reaction for the Haber process and include heat. Well, okay, I did that. Perfect. Number two, create a chart that lists possible stresses and the resulting direction of equilibrium shift and the impact of the chemical concentrations. Okay. Possible stresses, all right? Well, I can take N2 and increase it. I can take H2. Oops, before I do that. I can also decrease the N2. If I increase the N2, it's on the left. This whole reaction shifts to the right. Let me make this an equilibrium reaction here. If I decrease the N2, this whole thing shifts to the left. Well, let's think about that. If I increase this to the right, if I make the reaction go to the right, all right, what happens? Well, I get more NH3, I get less H2, and I get more heat. 
that happens. Oh, and I also, if you'll notice, I have, this is like a one. So I have a one and a three. There's like four gas mo molecules on the left, but I only have two gas molecules on the right. So let's keep that in mind. So if I shift this direction forward, I get a decrease in pressure. I go from four molecules to two molecules, which is less pressure. Okay, that's all what happens if I shift to the right. If I shift left towards the N2, then I'm going to increase everything on the left, which is hydrogen. I get increase in hydrogen. But I lose everything that's on the right. I lose ammonia. I lose heat. So I get colder if I shift left. And I'm going to gain pressure because going from two molecules to four molecules is an increase in pressure. So that's what happens if I screw around with the nitrogen. So if I'm making ammonia and I start pumping in nitrogen, if I increase the nitrogen, then all of this stuff happens. And if I start taking away nitrogen, then all of this stuff happens. Okay. Moving on. I can do the same thing with if H2. I can increase the H2 or decrease the H2. This should work exactly the same as my nitrogen. Notice that both H2 and N2 are on the left. So they will behave the same. If I increase nitrogen, it shifts right. Well, if I increase hydrogen, it should also shift right because they're both reactants. If I decrease hydrogen, it'll shift left. And you can basically copy, right? So if I shift to the right, then I get all the same things as happened up here. And if I shift to the left, I get all the same things that happened in here. Okay? Now, let's go on. So I've done those two. I've done the N2 and the H2. Let's look at the other side, the NH3 and the delta H. Well, let's just look at NH3 for now. NH, oops, NH3. I can increase that or I can decrease that. I can add more NH3 or I can take some away. Decrease NH3. Well, let's look at it. NH3, he's over here on the right. So if I make more of him, it's going to push to the left. So let's come down here. If I increase my NH3, this reaction shifts left. If I decrease it, it must go the opposite direction. Keeping in mind that every time I shift left, I'm getting this. Uh, increase in hydrogen, a decrease in ammonia, an increase in pressure, a decrease in delta H. Okay. So the last two things to talk about are heat. I can increase the heat of this reaction or decrease. Put it in an ice bath or a hot water bath. Well, where is heat? In this particular reaction, heat is right there. He is on the right. So I should expect heat to, to, to follow the same pattern as ammonia. So in other words, if I increase the heat, since he's on the right, he'll push to the left. If I decrease the heat, he will push to the right. And there's one more thing I can do, which is adjust the pressure. I can either increase or decrease the pressure. Now let's look. Pressure. Here we go. Well, like I said, I've got four molecules of gas on the left. Why did it do that? One nitrogen and three hydrogen on the left. I've got two on the right. I only have two ammonias on the right. Those are all gases. So when, when I increase pressure, it's going to push from the side that has four to the side that has two. We can assume that four molecules are more pressure. So if I increase pressure, I'm increasing the left, it's going to push towards the right. So let's do that down here. An increase in pressure of this system will push to the right. A decrease in pressure will push to the left. Okay. So that should be number two. A lot of stuff in number two. On to number three. Based on the balanced equation and information in your chart, describe the conditions that would produce the highest yield of ammonia. Highest yield of ammonia. What we want, where is that? So here it is. 
We want to increase ammonia. Well, notice that we increase ammonia by shifting this reaction to the right. So I need to do all the things that will shift it right. Namely, I need to add more N2, because that shifted right. I need to add more H2. I need to decrease NH3. Okay. And decrease the heat. And increase the pressure. So that was increase nitrogen. We'll shift it right. Increase hydrogen. Decrease ammonia. By decrease ammonia, you mean like siphon it off, take a take a syringe and like pull some ammonia out of there. Decrease heat and increase pressure. So if I had a, a big squeeze box, I could squeeze the container where this is happening. I could put ice around the container to cool it off and take away heat, which is going to make this reaction go far, faster forward. I could inject nitrogen and hydrogen into the reaction vessel and just keep pumping them in. It would make it go faster. And every time I make some ammonia, I can siphon that ammonia out, take it away from the reaction vessel, and that's going to make this reaction as fast as it possibly can. And then number four says, under what conditions does the Haber process actually run? Let's ask Google. Under what conditions does the Haber? Let's see. Ooh, that's fun. Looks like they add extra nitrogen, like we said, they add extra hydrogen in a one to three ratio which should make some sense. If you want this reaction to run really fast, you're gonna to need to pump in one nitrogen for every three hydrogens. So they get one liter of nitrogen for every, and three liters of hydrogen gas and pump them together. And then it says they do this at between 400 and 450 Celsius is the actual uh, ideal temperature. So there's a temperature that this works at and they run it at 200 atmospheres. So right now, <laughs> so if I'm writing all of this down, uh, let's try writing it down again. We do it at 200 atmospheres, about 400 Celsius. We add extra H2 and we add extra N2 and we do three of these for every one of these. And then once, once they've reacted and formed, the gases get cooled, and the NH3, if you cool it off, will liquefy. And you pour off the liquid, and that's how they get rid of the ammonia, so they are taking away the NH3. That's fun. And it says they use an iron catalyst. Iron catalyst, which just speeds up the reaction. So that's pretty cool. So just like we predicted, really high pressure. I mean, we're you, you and I are sitting at one atmosphere right now, so we're doing it 200 times uh, what the atmosphere is worth, which is, is a lot of pressure. And they run it at 400 Celsius, which is about ideal temperature, and then they cool off the gases at the end to pull them out. So that's kind of neat. All right, so that should be your equilibrium uh, pogel. And then when you come in on Thursday, we're going to do an actual uh, Le Chatelier principle lab, and you'll get to see it in action.